Good day, everybody. So I know that you are relaxed after the food, and now I have to talk to you about some difficult technical stuff, but I will try to make it as easy as possible. Of course, I will uh, uh, talk about technical details. Uh, so it's the results of our um, last uh, research grant. It's a new grant. Uh, only six months have passed, and these are, uh, if to say truth, our first results. Uh, so let us begin uh, with the basic concepts of cryptography. Let's cover them quickly for everybody to follow me. So in cryptography, uh, as always, we have our two heroes, Alice and Bob. Uh, first of all, uh, they have to generate the key and to share it. So Alice generates it and sends the key to Bob. Now we are talking about symmetric cryptography. So or private key encryption. So Alice takes a message and sends, uh, encrypts the message by means of her key using the, as you can see, you know, encrypt, uh, encryption algorithm and sends the cipher to Bob. Okay, Bob received the cipher and as he has the key, he can, uh, I will take the letter from here, I think, and he can decrypt, yes. Uh, the cipher by means of his key. Here we have Mr. Hacker that is looking at cipher and trying to get the information. We say that the scheme is perfect secret. If um, uh, the hacker, when looking at the cipher, doesn't, give, uh, doesn't get any additional information about the message. The only thing that must be true that after decrypting, after decrypting the encrypted message, of course, we must get our message back. Uh, as I talked about perfect secrecy, one time pad is a scheme that has perfect secrecy and it uses XOR. Here quickly is explained what is XOR. It's a bitwise operation. When we XOR 0 and 1, we get 1. And when we XOR the same values, so we get 0. So how one time pad work? We take the message of n bit long. We generate the key of the same size. And we just XOR key and the message. To decrypt the message, what we do, oh, we just reverse the operation. We uh, XOR key and C. Now here it's shown that it's really true. Uh, key and key XOR key is zero, and we are left with the message. Here it is illustrated how it works, and bit key and bit message, and we get and bit ciphers. Why uh, it's so good? Why it's not used in practice? It was used, for example, it was a phone line between. Uh, uh, Washington DC and Moscow, but now it's not uh, used in practice because of two big problems, because the size of the key must be uh, really big, because it must be of the size of the message. Today in real life, the messages are really big, and uh, it's one-time key. What does it mean? That it's secure if we use the key only once. Now here is a little uh, proof that uh, we cannot use the key twice, so here is the first cipher, the second cipher. The first cipher is got by uh, encrypting the first message with the key, and the second cipher is got by encrypting the second message with the same key. When we XOR the ciphers, once more key XOR key, uh, by ex uh, XORing uh, key with the key we get zero, and we are left with a XOR message. So if we uh, have two ciphers, we can just XOR them, and get the XOR of the message. So we leak some information about M1 and M2. Okay, we got it, but is it significant? Yes, it is. Because first of all, it's not longer perfect secret. Okay, it doesn't seem that it's really serious, but we will see it now. Uh, also, when we XOR M0 and M1, we see where the, B, the messages of the bits differ. Because if they differ, we will get the one X the XOR, and if they are the same, we will get zero. We can uh, analysis the frequency and also exploit the characteristics of ASCII. Here is uh, ASCII table, and what is interesting here that every letter in binary begins with zero, begins with zero one. Every space begins with zero zero. So, so if we XOR two letters, we, we get zero zero. But when we XOR the letter with a space, what we get? We get zero one. Uh, so it's uh, very easy to identify, identify uh, when we XOR the letter with a space. 
Here is just a real, uh, the little example for fun. Uh, we have to say first we XOR it, and here is the XOR that we got. Uh, here only in two bits are shown. Mm, what it gives us? It gives us the information that we XOR the, uh, the space with the letter, yeah? Because it's the same that XORing two messages, like we proved. So let us try, let us try to recover the letter. How we can recover it? For example, the XORs of ciphers gave us this value. We know that this value is got by XORing the space with something. And XORing back, we can easily identify that it's the letter P. OK, uh, as we said, that the key must be really big. Uh, for this, we have pseudo-random number generators. Uh, how they work? They take a the little seed and after what enlarge it to the big output. This uh, pseudo-random number generator, uh, I will call it parent G, can be um, used in one-time pad. In this case, perfect secrecy we will not have already, but we will have still uh, security, but different one, computational one. So here the key we have n bits, the message we have p bits, uh, where p is much more than n. We apply pseudo-random number, number generator to the n-bit message, and uh, after what we XOR the message with pseudo key in and get p-bit ciphertext. OK, very good. After what we got the revolution of uh, public encryption. Here, uh, Alex uh, already generated two keys, the secret one and public one. The public one she stores in some public repository, open one. And uh, by means of this public key, Bob take it and encrypt the message. So everybody can encrypt the message. In this example, Bob's, Bob can. And he sends the encrypted message to Alice, and only Alice can decrypt it. Why? Because she has the secret key. RSA is uh, the example of a public crypto system. Here, Bob uh, generates uh, the key. N is a, uh, is a multiplication of uh, two prime numbers. Uh, the public is N and E, secret is D. So he gives the public key to Alice. Alice encrypts the message. And afterwards, Bob decrypts it. No, it's just how RSA works. Uh, let us talk, uh, say a couple words about digital signatures because we say we will use them in the results. So it's a really key technology for making the internet and other IT inf infrastructure secure. They provide authenticity, integrity, the reputation and day of data. So having the really secure uh, digital signatures is very, very important in practice uh, for cryptography. Yeah? The signatures that are used in practice today are RSA that we just talked about, DSA, ECDSA. OK. We, be we began to work. I want to say once more that um, what I'm talking today is post-quantum cryptography. It's not quantum, it's post-quantum. It's um, the implementation of new crypto systems, yes? So we began to work uh, on it when we saw that Google signed a contract with the Wave that they began to create quantum processors, yes? That create a qubit, each qubit. Uh, each qubit, uh, qubit uh, double the uh, calculation speed, so these quantum processors can make the tasks that classical computers cannot. And what they can do, they can break our RSA. They can break, break all the crypto systems that are based on mathematical problems. And uh, for example, RSA is based, as we said, on factorization problem, and it can break it. And as you know, RSA is used everywhere in all the protocols. Uh, also, it's um, uh, underlying protocol. Um, it's using underlying protocol protected internet communication like SSL, S1. It's used in universities, in government organizations, and so on. So, breaking RSA, you, as you can understand, uh, will cause real, real house. Now, on October 2000, uh, this uh, now in October 23, 23rd, we got. Uh, very um, interesting news that Google said that they have uh, reached something called quantum supremacy. So they created a computer that is called Sycamore 
that solved very difficult problems in, 20, in 200 seconds. When they compared it to best classical computers that was released by IBM, and uh, it's really big, it's like two, two basketball courts, they said that IBM would break it in 10,000 years. Uh, so they showed that the computer is really quantum and he can do something interesting. And by the way, they concretely uh, made a random number generator by means of it. Okay, IBM didn't like it so much. And they said that Google lies a bit and um, uh, they don't need uh, the computer uh, that is called Summit. doesn't need uh, 10,000 years for it. It just uh, needs two days and a half. And what uh, Google did uh, is not a big deal. Uh, we do have um, different RSA alternatives. Here are the list of them, hash-based digital signatures, code-based, latest-based cryptography, multivariate, public key, crypto system. Last year I was talking about latest-based, but no, the, the integration with hash. And today uh, our results are only connected to hash-based digital signature schemes. So let's talk about them today. Okay, we have alternatives. So what to do more? But we have the problem because these alternatives are not efficient enough and they are not safe enough. For example, there was a attack, the successful attack, implemented by Neil Costigan, the student of Dublin City University, with his professor together, Michael so Scott, and uh, four more uh, countries were involved uh, in this attack, and uh, this attack um, was able to recover the key in uh, some 8,000 hours of CPU time. What the scientists answered about it, they said that the key was not enough and enlarged it. So no, it's already a big problem when it's hacked, yeah, it's attacked. Uh, also must be emphasized that this system cannot uh, be used to encrypt the same message twice and to encrypt the messages when it's known the correlation between them. Okay, uh, the efficiency spectrum is also very important. Inefficient uh, cryptography can be okay for us, but for the server that handles 1,000 processes per second, um, it is impossible to have inefficient cryptography. So let us talk, as I promised, about hash-based digital signatures. Uh, as we know, it's impossible. It's uh, very important because quantum computer breaks RSA and other um, digital signatures that are based on uh, difficult mathematical problems. And uh, these hash-based digital signatures, uh, they, they use just the hash function and uh, the security is um, based on the collision of this hash function. So, uh, first of all, name for the fee, one-time signature was proposed. Uh, there we have signature keys and verification keys. The signature, we have n pair, so 2n signature keys, n pairs of signature keys uh, by le of length n. To get the verification key, we just apply uh, one way function to it, and uh, here's how it's got, and get the um, verification key. Okay, to sign the message, we look at the message. If the first bit is zero, we take the, uh, we take the first element from the first pair, and if it's one, we take the second element. Uh, the uh, signature uh, length uh, that we get is n squared. Okay, to verify the signature, what we do, we apply the uh, follow, following equality. Uh, so we apply uh, uh, one-way function to our signature and uh, uh, compare it uh, with the uh, hash of our message. Why hash? Because the message can be of any size. First of all, we hash it to get the end bit message and are working with it. Uh, in, in the case of Lamport, to achieve the minimum security of 2 to the 18, uh, the total size of, public of the keys must be in 51,000 on the, the 200 bits. That is 50 times larger than in the RSA case. And also, as I said, uh, the signature length is much bigger than uh, in the case of RSA. Okay, we internet one time signature scheme was offered uh, to reduce the size of the signatures. But these one time signatures um, aren't convenient in practice uh, because uh, too many of these signature and verification keys, yes. And what was proposed 
Merkle kriptosistem veya the public key was uh, the public key replaces all these verification keys. Yes, and this public key is the root of the tree. Okay, how it works? Uh, the length of the key of the tree is chosen to be age more than two, and with one public key it is possible to sign two to the age documents, and uh, are generated x y and uh, y y signature and verification keys uh, in the same way like I talked to you, and uh, afterwards the hash values of this ver of the verification keys are calculated and we get the nodes of the tree. Now look how it works. So we hashed this verification keys, got two nodes. After what we concatenate them, hash the result. Uh, after what so we concatenate them, hash the result. We got two results, we concatenate them, hash the result. And like this, we go to the upper node. The only thing what we know that every right node for, uh, for example, for this node, this uh, node is called uh, flattened one. Uh, so, or authentication node, so ours. Uh, this node is a flatten for this, so every right node is a flatten of the left node. Uh, okay, how it works, uh, how the signature generation works. First of all, we get the message, we hash it to get the end bit uh, message. Afterwards, afterwards, uh, we generate one time signature uh, by means of Lamford and we internet how we want. For we for this we choose any signature key. With this we begin. Yes. Uh, after what we calculate the verification key, and our signature is a concatenation of uh, this one-time signature of our public key. What is public key? It's our root of this index of verification key, and all these anosis, uh, all these flatter nodes, all these anosis. So every right node. As you see, here we have a lot of a lot of. Uh, one time keys yes uh, so uh, so not to ge generate so many signature keys was offered to use pseudo random number generator uh, so it will take the seed uh, a by means of the seed and uh, it will generate all these parentheses so uh, here I, how it works we take the seed uh, apply it to parent G, get the new uh, get the new seed uh, and get the random number and by means of this we get all these signature keys. So we use only little, uh, only some little seed, uh, and uh, afterwards get all these uh, signature keys. Uh, it must uh, be integrated into phases once when we generate the keys, and afterwards we need once more these signature keys when we sign the message. Yes. Uh, so what is a um, great help here that we don't. Uh, that we don't save so many signature keys in the memory, uh, very big ones. We need to save only one seed. But, but it has the problems. Uh, let's talk about them now. What are these CSPRNGs? They are the pseudo-random number generators that are used in cryptography, uh, that, are, uh, that are considered to be secure in cryptography use. For example, Bloom Mikali and Bloom Sha generators uh, uh, are used very often in cryptography. And um, these uh, CSPRNGs are based on number theory. Yeah? For example, here is uh, the example of uh, how Shab um, works. Uh, so his, uh, its next output uh, works recursively, and so we get it uh, from the previous one. And uh, so xi plus 1 is xy squared uh, mod n. And what is n? n is the product of two prime numbers. Uh, as the seed, as the seed, it, it get, ah, uh, first of all, um, I, as the input, it, gets, it must get the seed, um, and uh, it must get x0. Uh, it must get the seed x0, and it must get n. Uh, the only very important thing that um, initial state x0, x0 must come uh, from true random number generator. Okay, there was uh, the article, there were published the results that the quantum computers are able to break this type of parent Concretely, they were able to break Blumicali parent gene, the attack on it was shown, it was using um, Grover algorithm and it was able to 
uh, reveal all the key, to recover all the key. So this type of attack can show to us that um, this type of PRNGs that are secured uh, against uh, classical computers cannot be secure against quantum computers. We offer to use uh, PRNGs that are based on hash. Uh, these PRNGs are HDBRG and HMACDBRG. Uh, they are NIST standards, so they are absolutely secure and they use a the hash function. It's very convenient for us because in our Merkle tree we use the hash function. We made the comparison of it and he hash the BRG uh, is much more efficient. And uh, as we know, it must get the, sec uh, the really random seed and we decided to uh, integrate the seed that we get from quantum rando random number generator. Okay, what are quantum random number generators? In 1961, the researchers offered to use quantum phenom phenomena as uh, a source of randomness. And after it, they began to use it a lot, to work, to work on it a lot. And at that time, radioactive uh, decay was already a particularly accessible source of true randomness. Uh, Geiger Muller tubes uh, were already sensitive enough to capture and amplify alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. At that time, mostly beta radiations was used. Uh, radio, okay. In a Geiger-Müller detector, um, a single particle makes uh, a ionization e effect uh, that afterwards is amplified in a Townsend avalanche. So, so we get a device uh, that creates a pulse for each detected particles. And um, the time of detection of this particle um, is um, exponential uh, random uh, variable and uh, uh, the probability of getting the pulse no, can be shown by this formula and um, uh, must be eff emphasized that uh, the number of um, pulses that occur in a concrete time uh, period follows a poison distribution and we can show experimentally that uh, these pulses occur in independent time and the probability of finding uh, the end pulses here it is, uh, where lambda is a mean number of pulses detected in one second. Uh, these QRNGs, um, based on radioactive decay, have a lot of common features. Mostly all of them have the counters, and by means of these counters, uh, random number are, um, the number of pulses are converted into random numbers. Uh, when, um, uh, when the device gets uh, the new pulse, it raises its counter, and in some concrete time, in some concrete time, it uh, resets it to zero. Uh, and another important element is timing with a digital clock. If, if we say that f is a frequency of the clock, uh, when f is more than lambda, we say that it's a fast clock. Uh, the fast clock, so it generates a lot of pulses in a, uh, a lot of uh, pul pul pulses in some concrete time. And if f is less than lambda, then we say that the clock is slow. Uh, the randomness, the randomness uh, in this time, in this type of generators, uh, can be converted into random values in different ways. For example, Vincent and the um, uh, Isida and the Ikeda and Vincent generator use the fast clock. So they get, uh, they, uh, they get the impulses and afterwards uh, the impulses are um, converted to random numbers. Okay, the sequence is not random, but uh, the distribution of the values must be corrected. For example, the Schmidt generator, it uses a slow, the slow clock. Uh, so, uh, when the, uh, the clock produces a new pulse, uh, the, uh, the, gener <coughs> the, the, the generator increases a number and uh, in some period it resets it. Uh, if we need to, if we must get the values from 0 to v, v minus 1, we just use modular V operation. If we use uh, V equal to 2, we can get just binary. So we can get 
zero and ones. Of course, in this case, the distribution uh, is also is also uh, not uniform. But when we take uh, when we use modification mod operation, we get only the very very small bias. Okay. Today, almost all existing quantum random number generators are based on quantum uh, optics. Why? Because the parameters of the light, of the quantum state of the light, have very good rather have very good property, have very good randomness property. So they give us the opportunity uh, to get very good implementation. For example, light from lasers, like uh, light emitting diodes, um, single photons, are very, very affordable and convenient alternative of radioactive uh, material, and are wonderful source, source of quantum randomness. Uh, today, we will um, use time of arrival generators, and they are the representatives of uh, optical quantum random number generators. And uh, why we talk a lot about uh, radioactive decay because uh, their principle are very similar to the QRNGs that use radioactive decay. Okay, how do they work? Uh, they have a rather weak uh, source of photons and um, they have um, a detector and um, a timing circuitry that traces the time of each detection. Uh, so the detector receives photon from lab in coherent light and from the coherent state uh, from a laser. And um, uh, this time is uh, exponential value. We are just taking, we are just taking uh, the timing intervals of uh, getting two uh, of getting two pulses, and afterwards, um, if the first ti uh, time interval is t zero and the second one is T1, we take the difference. If T1 is more than T0, we assign a to a bit 1. And in the opposite, uh, opposite case, we assign to it 0. Of course, there is very little probability that T0 will be equal to T1. Uh, it's very small probability. But uh, this about uh, this, ca this case, we also consider we use it in our implementation, and uh, of course this T1 and T0 are not integers, yes, they are some kind of um, float numbers, yeah, but uh, we convert them into integers. In 2007 was offered the first optical quantum random generation that used time detection. Uh, it took uh, photons from uh, the LED. So we offered to use uh, time arrival quantum random number generator as a seat of hash of the BRG. And here is a scheme what we do. Uh, so in the key generation, we don't, uh, we don't generate all this exercise. We just uh, take one quantum seed, uh, uh, pass it to the PRNG, and afterwards get all these signature keys. Uh, all the other um, process is the same, and uh, in the signature uh, phase, we, we need the signature keys once more, so we take uh, the same seed from quantum random number generators to get uh, the same keys, and uh, by means of uh, hash dbrng, that is the standard, we get all the signature keys. And the signature verification is absolutely the same process because here we don't need these pseudo-random number generators at all. Uh, about the security, of course, the system is secure because we, uh, what we uh, changed in the classical Merklin, we only um, integrated here the pseudo-random number generator that is quantum resistant because it uses hash functions. As you will see, we, use it here. we used here SHA-512. And as a seed, it gets a really, really random seed that is, uh, uh, that is got from a quantum random number generator. Yeah? So uh, we have made the implementation of it uh, in your familiar Python. Uh, separately, we made the implementation of um, uh, the uh, and uh, of quantum random number generator. Here we are importing them. 
Uh, okay, nothing interesting here. As you see, uh, we are getting the seed from quantum random number generator, and afterwards we are passing it to our DRBG. He, uh, it was uh, the key generation phase. In, uh, uh, in the signature phase, what we do uh, with the same seed of um, the RPG, uh, we generate the same signature keys. And as you can see, we, c we use tuple here, and afterwards we are just deleting it immediately. And as I said, that the time intervals, the time intervals can be um, the same with a very little probability. Now we check if they are the same, we just uh, reseed it. Uh, here is an um, efficiency of the scheme. No, it's uh, rather good. It checked for 128-bit message. Here is the same Python implementation of it that I showed. Yes. Here it works rather fast. No, of course, for little signature. And okay, that's it. That's what we made. And uh, if you have some questions, welcome. So for what I understand, you use quantum random number generators to improve the security of existing encryption algorithm. That is right? Uh, I use it um, to create a seed for pseudo-random number generator. And I do it, of course, uh, for made it real, for, for to have it really a random one. OK, mm -hmm. because uh, if we use uh, a random key, we can decrypt it at the destination, that is the problem. So we cannot use directly a key generated by a quantum random because we cannot decrypt the message. You are absolutely correct. Because of it, we use it as a seed mm -hmm. to the pseudo-random number generator. And uh, we are using the same seed, and after that, pseudo-random number generator gives us the different <laughs> pseudo-random values. Very good question. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, so the, the, the nice thing of that is we can adapt the uh, quantum random number generator to existing encryption schemes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, Here, how it works. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I have a question about the actual generation of the seed. Um, is, uh, do you know if there's a commercial uh, implementation right now for such uh, such devices you or or do you or what what do you think is the estimation of the cost of a, uh, uh, by the way by the way they do exist quantum random number generators they do exist they are checked and so on so on. as we said uh, from 1961 they began to use the uh, quantum phenomena to get the randomness. And, and this is so, and what is interesting, uh, we are thinking uh, of um, buying a couple of them and bringing to Georgia for experiments. Thank you. Hi. D um, do you have any implementations that you have done on uh, hardware security modules with this schema? Uh, no, no. It's a new result. It's a new result that uh, what is done only the software implementation for now. So only software right now? For now, but, yes. But mm -hmm. do you plan any yeah, integration yeah. with any hardware security module provider? Uh, I think yes. I think uh, we will try it. First of all, we have to bring this quantum, to buy these quantum random number generators to get the seed from them. Afterwards, to apply here and uh, see what, how it works Is in it real life. Is it something that you see it in the near future? I'm, I mean, if we get the finances for it, oh, okay. we are working on it, so I hope that yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, as I understood, uh, you are using uh, quantum seed in uh, PRNG, and 
Can you change the size of the seat if it's necessary? Ah, yes, yes, it's dynamic. Here is shown. Uh, here you can see that I specify the... One minute, I will enlarge it. Here you can see that I specify the size and I pass it to the uh, QRNG. Thank you. Okay, so suppose I do get my hands someday on a QRNG. How may I go on and prove that it is indeed a QRNG and not a PRNG? Uh, how it can be the PRNG because it's a hardware and it's quantum one. Well, yes. let's say that it uses is uh, it to me as a service, so I don't actually get to see it physically. How yes, do I but it but 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 as I said, uh, uh, in 2007 was offered already the first commercial ones, and they are effectively. Um, sold and uh, the physics proves that it's really quantum random number generator and so on. Okay, thank you, but uh, what about 50 years from now, let's say? About what? 50 years from now when I will be able to get a generator as a service, so not as a physical appliance. How can I sample it and prove to myself at least that okay, it is truly quantum and not just a PRNG or whatever? Uh, I understand what you say, for example, uh, the Google News that I talked uh, today, yes, they co concretely showed that they created the new random number generator, the quantum one. Uh, IBM says that uh, it's not so spe special as they say, but nobody says that it doesn't, that it's not quantum. I read a lot of articles, a lot of discussions about it, and what the experts say, they said that it, they did really get the quantum one. The only problem, uh, that there is there, that they are still far away from, um, uh, from implementing Grower and Shor's algorithm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. So as we see, it works. <laughs> thank you. Um, how easy do you think it would be to in integrate a quantum number generator with today's classical computers? I think I think that in any case it will be a good idea because um, we can see that uh, a lot of PRNGs are broken, yes, uh, so um, theoretically of course. Once more this Grover's algorithm is for now only theoretical but we can prove that so a lot of PRNGs are broken, yes. So um, in any case to have the quantum randomness in uh, today's scheme is rather a good idea because um, Maybe tomorrow uh, these quantum computers already um, will, will be um, uh, in practice, yes, and they will uh, maybe break our um, existing PRNGs and all this stuff, yeah. And uh, follow up on that, how hard would it be to build a quantum number generator at home? At home. Uh, I think it will be hard, yeah, but I don't have any. I'm going to buy, so I don't think that it's too easy. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, Maxim, can we take one more question? It's okay? Okay, the last yeah, one, okay? The last one, mm -hmm. okay. Do you know any PKCS 11 or HSM? Do I know what I didn't hear? Do you know any Public. PKCS uh, 11 device, mm -hmm. like HSM, on the market that uh, benefits uh, of quantum uh, random net generators? Uh, I think, no, I, I don't know if to say truth. I don't know uh, if they use it in some uh, uh, crypto schemes for now. Mm, uh, for commercial use, I think they don't exist. They, they exist only the separate quantum random number generators, but uh, the whole uh, systems as I know, they don't exist. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Maxim. Thank <laughs> it was you. Good.